When I came back to America, I very much felt I was in the land of the conquered people. That it had been trashed, that it was not the same country I left. I was very upset and my family didn't want to hear about it. I began dreaming of a sisterhood that could heal the people, heal the valley. I was walking home from a meeting with local activists. A woman sees me and rushes across the street. She's crying and she says, sister, sister, I lost my job. I have a seven-year-old son. I am an alcoholic. I was heading to the liquor store and you're a sign from God. She fell into my arms sobbing and crying. I looked up at the street light like it's God as I'm hugging this woman and going, please forgive me. Then I set her back and I said, have you ever tried the cannabis plant? And she said, wait, what kind of nun are you? Cannabis? We have an epidemic nationwide. Majority of people do not like the idea of smoking pot. So, as far as I'm concerned, anything that takes over your body like that should be uh, controlled. Who doesn't know someone who smokes grass or uses grass? I could be talking to a judge, I could be talking to our head, our district attorney. Who don't you know that doesn't smoke? Americans want marijuana, and we are unmindful of the ugliness that is involved in getting it to us. I think most of us nowadays don't even call it a drug anymore. It's just weed. Even if we were to compare it to alcohol, kids our age still have a sour attitude towards alcohol versus weed. People say it's just marijuana, but the federal government still treats marijuana as an, an illegal drug, so it's not just marijuana. On, on you know face value, just looking at it, yeah, it is just marijuana, but there's so much, uh, so many dark things behind it. The Catholic and the Muslims and the Church of Scientology and the Baptists will not stand up. We're gonna lose this battle of drug addiction to Satan and the enemy himself. Growing plants is dangerous in many ways, which is what scares me about uh, my mom or anyone in my family being in the business. There was m multiple instances where she was, I feel like she was in danger. And I would always tell her, I don't want you to lose your life over this but I'm still going with it, you know, because it's what pays the bills. And mom feels that the spirituality is what makes people listen. They want to know what's going on. Dorset County, and the soil is so great that oh, we yeah. expect to yeah. get like eight to 10 pound plants. That's where we're at. <laughs> Here's my card. We have nuns that are drug dealers. The sisterhood is delivering cannabis to dying people. It doesn't matter how you dress up. If you are dealing illegally, then you are drug dealing. We are on a sacred calling here. We need to stop all of it all together. And this is the reason why I'm on this mission. So much he doesn't understand. It's an age old problem, drugs ruin lives. We'll take their product and I will take it to the dump and I will cite them into court. After all the betrayal in my life, after being left penniless and homeless by my own family, everyone needs to understand that I will do whatever it takes to protect what I have built. Oh, there is Chris in her nightgown. That's not her wedding dress. Chris, Chris, I've got you on camera. I know, mother. I was born and raised in Wisconsin, educated in Wisconsin. I got my degree in business education. I was a corporate girl. I once voted for Ronald Reagan. I married my husband, Gary, when I was 28 years old. 
my privilege to present to you for the first time, formally and officially, as husband and wife, Gary and Christine. It was one of the happiest days of my life. I was very much in love with him. We were happy together in those early years, and I felt like I was living the American dream. Within a year, I was pregnant with our first son. Okay. This is it, one month pregnant, five and a half weeks. Three years later, we had three children and we're living in a big suburban house in Kentucky. Hey, Farmer Gary. What are you planning? Tomatoes. Yeah. We had a great marriage. Everybody was jealous of us. We were happy. Thank me. My wonderful wife. That's right. She's so sweet all the time. Yeah. Tell me you love me. I don't. Come on, Christine. Okay. Go, go next to your husband. He loves me. Get over there. Hey, wave to the family. Tell the camera how much you love me. I had my business degree, and I was ambitious. As the children got a little older, he chose to stay home and be with them, while I chose to grow the consulting business. Oh my goodness, you think you got enough babies, Dad? I got my babies. Gary ended up staying at home, being the stay-at-home dad, and he was just always a rock-solid guy. He wanted to be the stay-at-home mom. It was a lot of diapers he had to change and a lot of meals he had to fix, and he was a very front and center father. He was an excellent father with my children. This is the tape. I'm reading. Bye, Bye Alex. Yeah. As far as I remember, he was a really good dad very attentive, he was there for me. Uh, he took me to soccer practice, and he pretty, he much did, he did what he was supposed to do. We spent quality time together. She was the breadwinner of the family. She was the CEO, she was the boss. She was the one that, the, I'm not gonna take anyone's shit lady. So growing up, that was definitely an amazing role model for me was as corporate as you would expect in the banking world. There was no rebellious side of her whatsoever. I worked as a consultant in telecommunications and turned out I was really good at it. I used to say I implement businessmen's fantasies. I made a lot of people a lot of money and I accepted the assignment for an American company to live in Amsterdam and help them launch their telecommunication services in six countries. Over the course of the, like, 10 years in the Netherlands, my consulting company banked a million dollars. My husband, all about savings. We were all about savings. And he agreed that he had set aside $300,000 for me to relaunch my consulting company in America. Okay, so that's a picture for me in my office in Kentucky. So, in our house in Kentucky. That's my device. Oh, the one below is the freezer, Meg. They were getting themselves established again. Is this the living room? So everything was set up for a happy family life. It's three monkeys. But I guess it's quite, all of that's quite deceiving once you find out that the other things are actually going on. No. It feels bigger, doesn't it? Yeah. What are you guys doing up there? After they had moved to Kentucky and owned their own home there, Gary decided to take the kids camping, and it was his sister that had come over on Saturday morning with some mail um, in his name, but, but with different addresses. I guess the curiosity got the better of her. She opened up, you know, one or more of those envelopes, and lo and behold, there were some financial statements. There was a bit of a shock because there were these accounts that she wasn't aware that they existed. I guess fortuitous that, that the, the mail was handed to her, and then she suddenly saw the truth. So the million dollars that had piled up into our business account he just seized. He said, you're poor, I'm rich, deal with it. 
you know, I could hear her trembling over the phone line because it was uh, excruciating, painful. This is him moving money, 25,000 out of there and into there. He took all of the money, why he couldn't just give us a little for food. He did some really horrible things. The first month we were in Holland, he opened a Swiss account and started funneling money out of the business into a Swiss account and then an Isle of Man account and then a South American account. Every which way that he could handle the books and make the money go to his account and make it look to me like the money was going to the proper place, he did that. My attorney, when she looked at what happened, she actually said, I think he premeditated this divorce from the day he married you. The horror of a 17-year marriage with a man who I thought I was going to be with for the rest of my life uh, decided he hated me. And how did it make me feel? Like a cannon to the chest, like completely devastated, humiliated, and uh, stupid. You can't help. You blame yourself for not seeing things. And that's how I felt. I felt humiliated and stupid. I'm sure a psychologist could have a heyday in terms of what that betrayal put her, you know, what it put her through. That was the end of that relationship. because he wanted money or even likes money, he stole it for control. The, the fight for the money is still going on. I mean, this was just a litigation nightmare. It's been a 10-year battle. You know, evidence packages. The example of that he wasn't paying child support. I bought a new car right after the divorce, but he can't pay child support. And anyway, all these boxes are sort of just loaded with all the evidence of everything that happened since the day. And so my attorney, she says, I gotta tell you something and it's gonna be a bit shocking. And I said, yes. And she said, he never divorced the wife before you. I was horrified. I was totally horrified. I believed he was divorced and married him. I haven't decided if I'm gonna go after him about the bigamy thing. I had a Sophie's Choice right from the beginning. My attorney said, you can fight for the money or you can fight for your children. Make up your mind. That was my million dollars. He hadn't earned a cent of it. Those were my children I gave birth to him. I had to say I'll fight for the children and I'll go after the money later to get the children out. I simply left and headed for family in California. I moved in with my uncle who was also going through separation at the time and um, he was struggling as a single father raising his two sons and my mom was struggling raising us. My sister's my sister, I'll have her for the rest of my life and her kids didn't have a dad, so it was kind of a good idea for her to move out here, and that way I could kind of play the dad role for her kids, and she could play the mother role for my kids. And there was none of this wearing the nun's costume and all that stuff. There was none of that. That came about later on. And so I settled into a whole new life with my children in California. Of course, I had no idea that this was just the beginning of my, my nightmare. The Great Valley of Central California, a valley filled with deep, fertile soils. The farmers on this land harvest rich crops. Today, the Central Valley of California is a rich source of food and wealth for the whole nation and provide employment for millions of people. In fact, a great many different kinds of crops are grown here on the rich soil. Medicinal marijuana has been legal for a while. 
Our local ordinance says a person can grow up to 12 plants. And this is the food basket of the world, and the number one cash crop in California has been marijuana. And we have derived no benefit from that whatsoever because it has made certain illicit growers wealthy beyond their wildest imaginations. My brother started talking about cannabis laws and the changing in California and how if we were smart, we would start a cannabis business. And I, I pretty much started right from the beginning. She needed an income. Around here, really hard to find a good income. Even for a woman as smart as she is, the cannabis was good income, you know? After the financial crisis of 2008, the agricultural industry of the Central Valley has really suffered. Luckily, the cannabis laws in California changed in 1996, and it became illegal to grow cannabis for medical purposes. The whole Central Valley grows weed. The whole Central Valley. From all the way up north, California, all the way down south. Counties that have embraced cannabis have created an enormous amount of wealth through taxing it. While there's lots of legal growing for medicine, there's still lots of cannabis growing for the black market. Nowadays, there's a lot of farmers growing cannabis. Everybody decided why go to the mountains when you can do it in your backyard. But it's the same way that there's people that grow it. There's also big crews of people out there that are ready to steal it, ready to catch you sleeping. You know, what's what you're doing? You can get into a lot of trouble. We were settled in California for only four months and I could see that I wouldn't be able to work in my chosen profession without leaving my children for travel. I was excited. I had never really been involved in anything like this before. I was a corporate girl. I was good at business, and Gary and I used to grow lots of produce in our backyard, so I knew we could do this. I essentially said, okay, we'll grow weed, we'll cure weed, we'll deliver weed, we will be the weed family. I agreed to get into the cannabis business under a number of conditions. It had to be legal, we would pay all taxes, we would only supply medicinal cannabis to sick people, and there'd be no black market deals. Pretty soon we had our first crop and we reached out to local doctors for clients. I was just serving dying patients and very, very sick patients because they're the only ones the doctors would send me. And the Central Valley is so poor. So we supplied them with cannabis whether they could pay or not. You know, just bad karma to let people go suffering to their death. But at this time, legalized cannabis was quite new in California. Our first deliveries were hysterical because no one could believe that somebody was actually delivering cannabis in this town. And so we would knock on the door. The person would answer the door, stick their head out and look around to see like if there were any cops hiding in the bushes or something before they would let us in. The year I moved in with my brother, this is the photo of the five kids. We had boys ages 14 to 22, and my daughter, who's 13. They each responded differently to their mom's new career path. <laughs> like, I just never invited my friends over, because so I was like, they're not, they're not ready for this. And none of my friends were allowed in my backyard, because I didn't want them to see all the plants. Where are you going, babe? My mom didn't like the idea of us doing things black market because it attracted uh, thieves. You guys are such troublemakers, such troublemakers. If you're going the legal route, which is much more expensive, obviously, you have to pay taxes, you have to hire guards. Yes. Come on, monkey. I'm going to throw you on the other bed, monkey. But it's the safe route, and then you don't have to worry about those things. But I didn't know what to expect. I knew that it was highly likely that my kids, like my brother's kids, would smoke weed while they're in high school. And I didn't try to fight that. I figured I'd just put them to work. Alex was so big and strong, I had him doing all sorts of jobs. 
he was like the man of the house. If you keep them too busy, they can't smoke that much. They just found us out there when they were rotor tooling. Oh, it's a dinner bell. So when the weed farm kicked off, I had a lot of fun with that. At the time, I wasn't allowed to smoke. So I was um, actually stealing my mom's roaches at the time. I showed up to dinner one night really stoned, and she didn't want to call me on it because she didn't know how to handle that situation. <laughs> my uncle called me out on it. He was like, why are your eyes glazed over? My response was, uh, is the cat, because I'm allergic to cats. Uh, it was the only thing I could come up with, and they knew it was bullshit, but they let it slide. Things were going really well. I'm sure all many farmers have the same pride. But I had rules. I ran this operation as a legit business. Oh, whoa, that's really strong. Everything had to be accounted for. No, all the weed had to go from inventory to being booked, and there could be no missing links. She's a good businesswoman. She's an extremely smart person. You know, um, she knows business. But nobody was becoming millionaires. Nobody was taking any vacation. You know, with most homes, you have to have a two-income. You know, it was hard for me to afford the mortgage and everything on this was just one income. We'd been operating for about three years when I walked in on a black market deal being done by my brother. And I exploded, my Irish temper exploded. I exploded because I blew up. That night, he pretty much physically threw me out the front door. I literally watched my uncle grab my mom by the neck and force her out of the house. And I don't understand that. There was no violence between us. There was no, no you know, we, we don't raise, we don't raise our hands to each other. We're not that kind of people. You know, we're, we're, we're mouthy. My brother took a bat to my knees and my family graded my howls. I have my principles and I have my rules and she has her principles and her rules and they work like. And, and, I, and I say tough, my house, you know? I, I didn't think of it as much of a disagreement. I looked at it as, these are my rules, my house, my rules. Live with it, you know, or don't. Christine, she didn't get the support from the family, you know, when we had our disagreement. And they all took my side. Now my family's telling me, leave your children, you'll be fine. It didn't work out. It was the weed business. You should have known the weed business would not work out. I told her there's no fair smile for him. She should be the witch. She usually is. That's right. What a nice mother, hey? Suddenly, I was homeless. Walking downtown Merced with no home and looking up at the buildings that are being air conditioned and heated and the lights are on, and seriously, I have no place to stay. It was a sudden realization of what homeless people really deal with. It was a little rough going. It was rough going more for her than it was for me because I was, I was still in the house. She was just living basically almost on the street kind of thing. My mom was going through depression, and that's what I've learned, um, like, in the face of trouble. A lot of times, the people closest to you are the ones that will hurt you the most. The betrayal of a family. I realized that my whole thinking, how I thought about my family, was built on a fallacy. Those values I was raised with, they don't exist. They never really loved me. They loved the reflection of themselves in my eyes. Nobody had it in them to go see after that fight if she was okay, except for me. 
and at first it was all about trying to make sure my mom was safe and and stable because she always makes sure that I'm safe and stable. I can't do shit without her. And during this time, we were trying to find out where our next meal was gonna come from or where we were gonna sleep. I was hungry. I was not thinking about going to class, obviously, because I need to get fed, I'm thirsty. We had a legitimate, very serious discussion about suicide, the two of us. Betrayal is too huge. I absolutely thought about suicide every day. That really, I need to go be with the angels where it's safe because this place is just too freaking scary. We had discussions about maybe we should do it with pills. Because, you know, pill, you know, Vicodin, it won't be painful. And then we're like, ugh, we have no money. We can't even afford pills. And eventually I thought about it and I, I managed to sort of talk her out of the idea because at first I was like, fuck yeah. The only thing that kept me from doing that is the, the sense that they would have won. Then my children were truly without their mother. After four months of homelessness, my mother agreed to help me, finally. So she had to co-sign for me. I had no job. I was like 56 years old and being treated like 17-year-old trying to get a house. So I had to take my mother's help to get in a house. For $1,000 a month, I could rent a little house by the railroad tracks. In 2015, um, at about 2 o'clock in the morning, I get a knock on my door, and a young gentleman asked me for help. A home invasion robbery in Merced County has left a man dead and two others wounded. Deputies said the intruders wanted marijuana, but ended up in a gun battle with the homeowners. Somebody that was out of my sight ripped the door open and forced their way into my house. My son heard all the ruckus and, and he came out of his bedroom back there with a 22 rifle that he has never shot, opened up fire on him, killed the guy that I was fighting with, put five rounds into him, but caught my finger in the, in the, in the gun shooting. Investigators believe the suspects picked this place because it's been known for medical marijuana dispensary, which is prohibited in Merced County. Jeez, you know, how much... You know, I, I look at it as uh, sometimes you have to take it as signs from the universe that you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing. How many times have you heard, I should be able to do what I want to do with my body? I hear that all the time. Well, then go live in a cave. Because when you become addicted, everybody in your family's affected. Your neighbor next door got to deal with your addiction and your whole community. When you become addicted to marijuana, you don't only ruin your life, but you ruin the lives of many other people at the same time. In Merced County, you're not allowed to have a cannabis business. You are allowed to have 12 plants for personal use, but they don't have a way of permitting you or licensing you for doing a business. I took my 12 personal plants and started making oils and lotion and began selling them around the world, although I didn't have a license for doing business in my home. So I was dancing around the cottage industry laws and the personal cannabis grow right laws, knowing that I was pushing boundaries. And it's the county sheriff who sets those boundaries. I have to get stoned if I'm going to listen to him. From Merced County's community. We are your voice, Merced County News Television. Now, here's Diana Perez with Merced County Sheriff Vern Warnke. We've got gang gangsters 
that have married each other, that raise gangster kids. And a lot of times when we have the homicides, there's an outside influence, whether it be in gangs or substance abuse. And a lot of the substance abuse is illegal narcotics. We are going to be actively and aggressively going after them. What we have to do is get into the lives of some of these kids and maybe we can start to see by educating them. Cannabis, as far as I'm concerned, can be very dangerous. We have an epidemic nationwide. And it's people just wanting to get high, and I don't understand it. They're non-productive, they're uh, leeching off of society, and the few people that um, aren't doing the drugs are the ones working and holding down a job and paying the taxes to subsidize those drug users' lives. You know, how would you like to have your surgeon just before you go on open heart surgery sitting outside the hospital, grabbing a, uh, a joint, smoking it, and saying, "Yeah, I'm all right." But that's what people, oh, it's all right. Well, really, if it's that all right, would you want that to happen? How would you like the, the two pilots up in the 747 as they're flying, smoking this up? Well, if it's all right, then it's all right. How about the cops showing up at your house? How would you like them stoned out of their gourd while they're trying to enforce these laws and do the right thing and make the right decision? Anybody that's wanting to do something should be doing it legal. And the government is here to protect citizens. But the bottom line is the amount of gang marijuana that's growing, it's unreal. There's a county to our north that has actually declared a state of emergency with regard to the epidemic. And if our numbers keep going up, that'll be one of my next moves too. So officers take it upon themselves to come in on their days off to help eradicate this because they also know that it's a problem. So this place that we're going now, there's a gentleman that's wanted on felony warrants. The last time that he was contacted here by his probation officer, uh, they located several larger illegally grown marijuana plants. He's not very cooperative with law enforcement. I'm afraid the local growers are going to do is think they're being raided by other bad guys. Make no mistake, the gangs will shoot at the cops. OK, these are 12 plants here, though. All right, you know that this is one parcel of land, right? I know that one. Yeah. Okay. We've been doing it for about four years. Okay, so what's gonna happen is between both grows, we can only have 12. So you might have to go six and six. This is one parcel of land, and this is where we run into our problem. We have two different people's growing on one property, so it's only 12 plants per parcel. So we have 12 plants being grown there to maximize the limit, and now I think we have an illegal grow over here as well. So this one over here is... I don't know whose that is. We, we, we don't know whose grow over here? Uh, I'm not sure. Do you know about how many plants are I over there? I don't know what's over there. I don't go back there. Three years ago, this county was number one for population for the amount of homicides. It was a lot of gang-related homicides. There is a problem, and you know, it's horrible. Sheriff's Department! Obviously, they're hiding it behind a bunch of uh, boxes. So typically, this is our 24. one of the small outdoor grows, 24 plants. But with the 12 there, it's 36. Okay. And we've hit grows before where people have put their life savings uh, into growing marijuana. And we've come out and um, done what we're supposed to do, uh, enforce the law, uh, left them with 12 plants. And they've been literally in tears uh, because they sunk their life savings into uh, an endeavor that's really, there's a lot of gray area to it. The problem is, right, it's not just being used for medicinal purposes. So when you are responsible for an entire county and you have something in your county that spurs home invasion robberies, homicides, violence, gang activity, you almost have to be of the mindset that uh, it's zero tolerance, I want it out. But we're doing everything we can to help combat it. And I will take their product and I will take it to the dump and I will cite them into court. By the end of the week, we're dumping probably five to 8,000 pounds. So that's what, that's what goes to the lab for every Friday. Sometimes we'll hit a house that's so big we can't even fit it all in one trailer. We have to come back. 
<laughs> Medicinal marijuana has been legal in California for a while. To me, as a ruse to get it to the final point where recreational marijuana use is going to be there. And it came out to 1,180 pounds. That's how much we dumped. Multiply that by a thousand. 1.1 million dollars. We take action on anybody that breaks the law. If you're a producing criminal cannabis products, that's punishable by fine. Um, or local imprisonment. As we get nearer to fall, the cops are out and looking and ripping the plants. And even though we don't sell in the black market, and even though we have no THC, they could come rip our plants. Yeah, I was in the legal shop. You can't sell, period. Right now, I don't have a license to grow more than 12 plants. So what makes it illegal is that we do not authorize any type of uh, marijuana dispensaries in Merced County, period. Even though we're not a dispensary, we're always at risk of their showing up and ripping out thousands of dollars of plants. Because we're on the route back to the sheriff's office, they like to stop in front of our house with truckloads of weed just to show us what they just ripped and to ask me if I want to make a contribution. My crop will be under threat. You're going to convince me that those 12 plants are for single use. You have to smoke that stuff nonstop every day, and you still couldn't. When they start getting into these multiple plants, the only reason they're doing it is because they're selling it. OK? So the bottom line is, is I've been tasked with a job, and I take it very seriously. But we're just going to grow it and take our chances. Are you guys okay if we just like plant them randomly around the property where maybe the sheriffs won't notice them? Yeah, I don't mind. We could plant one over there, over here. I mean, they won't be our great plants, yeah, but they'll be extra we'll bonus plants. And the worst the sheriff's gonna do is rip them out, right? So we just gotta make sure that if he counts them, that we're like, take that one and take that one. I mean, technically we could get a thousand dollar fine. <laughs> but if they don't notice all our plants, one plant's worth what? Three grand? Yeah. So I think it's a business risk we should take. There's a seed of you somewhere in here. Look at the sunlight right there behind the gazebo. Mm -hmm. Is there yeah. somewhere back there that we could yeah. poke them? And then we'll hide some more. We'll hide the babies, like find spots where the sun hits. <laughs> I'm willing to risk it if you guys are willing to risk it. Okay, so we'll get these in the ground. And right, I'm gonna get the Abbey ready. Right. At one point, conventional wisdom was that the earth is flat. At one point, conventional wisdom was that women had smaller brains than men. So conventional wisdom is that cannabis is bad. The whole issue is testing the nation. Our business is testing the boundaries of the laws. And our right to grow this medicine and, and do what we're doing, support ourselves. Don't try and blow a smoke, smoke, smoke screen up and tell me you've got this wonderful product and you have to do all these other things to sell it. Don't think for a minute a habit's gonna slow me down in prosecution, because that won't, so. Without the official licenses, we won't be able to grow. We need a license, we need to be fully legal in order to grow the business. So your biggest obstacle is maybe uh, right now the way law enforcement looks at it, and maybe you're always looking over your shoulder for that bus maybe coming yes, down. Yes, yes, yes. We're scared. We've and, never uh, been legitimized. And well, so how can I step out and say to an olive farmer, yes, it's perfectly safe to play with us, yeah. and we'll make more jobs together when we don't have our conditional use permit, and it's been 18 months. Mm -hmm. 
is for, you're a defense attorney, so you spent a lot of time keeping people out of jail for cannabis in your career. Do you think they would charge someone like me with selling? Do you think they would? Well, uh, <clears throat> if they if if you were classified, they they classify what you're selling as in in that in, as a controlled substance. Okay. If they was met that classification, then yeah, they they wouldn't have a problem charging you at all. Merced County really doesn't want it. Marijuana never had really that legitimacy, certainly not in the 20th century. Then it got caught up in the counterculture and associated with opposition to the Vietnam War, and so you couldn't get to a point where you could really debate, well, does this have medical application? Effectively, there are two well-known components in the cannabis plant, THC and CBD. The science behind it gets everyone confused. Hello, my name is Dr. David Allen. I'm a retired cardiac surgeon and a member of the International Cannabinoid Research Society, ICRS. That means I'm a cannabinoid research scientist. The difference between THC and CBD is, is what they bind to. THC binds onto the receptor, CB1 receptor, that actually gets you high. CBD works by different mechanisms than THC. Uh, CBD binds onto CB2 receptors. It also binds onto uh, opiate receptors, serotonin receptors, and dopamine receptors. In the future, cannabis will be used to stop cancers. It will be used to stop strokes and, and heart attacks to stop diabetes, to stop seizures, and a multitude of other diseases. This is the Model T era of this science. I harvested my first CBD crop in April, and I could see that already this was gonna sell out. So I had to get a CBD crop. This, things have changed so much in the last three, four years, but three years ago, no one in California was growing CBD. I couldn't buy it from Oregon CBD. There wasn't such a thing. No one was doing CBD. So to get CBD, I got three men together who were growers. One, a Mexican guy bought this land, this creepy, ghost-ridden, abandoned firehouse from ages gone by. You can see that the tweakers camped out and shot up their needles like little heroin den parks within this property. I bought the gun and I was responsible for having the crop guarded. My son Alex wanted a car. So if he took his two nights a week guarding the crop, at the end, he would get a car, which you did get a car, didn't you? I did. So that part worked. But I knew Alex couldn't do it alone, so that's when I asked Zane. I was just thinking, like, I'm just gonna hang out and watch some plants, and you know, as people come by, they see somebody's gonna be there, or they're gonna leave, right? And we had 60 plants at this point that were worth about $60,000. Another month would have taken that crop from being worth 60K to 240K. That last month is when you get all the grow and the volume. We were gonna get a quarter million dollar crop. We were taking turns staying in the RV. One night at about five o'clock, the dog started making noise. I hear the alarms go off and the dog's barking and I get up and I go out and I see a guy with a mask and, and I yell at him, hey! And he just looks up at me and then says, you're not supposed to be here. And I was like, no, hey, get the fuck out of here, right? And he just looks back up at me again and then goes down to pull in the weed, right? Zane just picked up the gun and boom, shot right at where the guy was. And he just moves over like a couple of feet and goes back down to pull in weed. So Zane shot in front of him. But this guy... Stopped and ran this way, so Zane shot in back of him. I, I think I shot off like three or four rounds before he's like, oh shit, okay, how do I get out of here? How do I get out of here? Zane pointed through the cactus. He gave him one route and could hear him yelling. Then he hops off the fence and, and takes off and leaves. So I got a hold of all the partners involved in this deal and said, come on, we got to take the crop out. Someone's going to get killed. And they didn't want to. I don't know what we were thinking. We should have left immediately, but we don't. I would have left running out of there as soon as the first bullet rang. 
we just put up more cameras, more alarms, and uh, some uh, boards with, with nails in them. It's my turn to come out here that night at 11 o'clock and guard the place. I was afraid to go alone, so I asked Zane to go back with me. It was like 5 o'clock in the morning. I hear the alarm go off. As soon as I heard the dogs rustling, I said, it's showtime, Zane. Put my shoes on, grab the gun. Two bullets went under my bed. Bullets just start boom, 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 boom. Tried to put bullets in the propane tank. They were trying to just blow us up in a few shots. Boom, 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 boom. Glass shattering in all the vehicles, glass shattering in the RV. One bullet went right past my mom's head. They really intended to kill us. I got somebody unloading. Riddling our RV with bullets. Boom, 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 boom. boom. A bullet come through the RV and skim right past his nose. I'm out of bullets because this fucking gun has only got five fucking bullets in it. It's the worst fucking gun ever. I can't believe she bought this piece of shit gun. It was pitch black. I gotta I load these fucking bullets by hand. The gunmen shooting us were a cover for somebody else stealing the plants. I hear a bunch of noise and rumbling. He shot towards the plants. I hate to shoot like this because I don't know what I'm shooting. The two scream, call it off. We're going to get killed. The bullets stop shooting. This is an emergency. Guns. It's bad. Pretending that he's on the phone with 911. We need everybody here. Give him the address, but I was talking into dead space. Of course, he's not talking to freaking nobody. What Zane said is you can stop your award, Academy Award winning performance because they were gone, and I didn't know it. I called everybody I knew who had a gun and offering $100 to come help me get my crop out. We weren't about to leave empty-handed because we spent all summer growing those. Take the crop down for the course of the next six hours. Uh, they're absolutely gorgeous. They tasted delicious. They smelled beautiful, very potent. I hear the night grower hollering to the men that it's all done. Get in your vehicles. We're going. He didn't want to be there any longer than he had to be. I had to say, hey, if you want to collect your pay today, those of you who work for me, you don't go anywhere until we collect every last leaf, every last stick. I want them to be shocked like a rapture where everything goes up in the air. I wanted it to be like that. We didn't leave them a single leaf. My daughter was the worst because she cried when she found out. And she's, she really tried to convince me that my rails have gone off the track, that when I'm in shootouts in the cannabis business, it is time to retire. If you don't do your homework at the get-go, like that so it's gonna happen the night grower was so angry at me and it took like a few days before i got to understand that he was all about our safety and i was all about my ridiculous rapture and showing those thieves who's boss i what i would like is a better gun <laughs> uh or or some better security really some better security who needs the shootout uh even if you do shoot somebody uh and get shot in the process who needs all that if guns got to honestly be involved, the way I see it is basically don't even do it. I've seen a lot of uh, dumb shit happen to people over the years, basically. Uh, you can't just go to any place to be thinking, ah, it's a good spot until you do your homework completely on it, you know? You got to see who the neighbors are, see what the history of the place is, first of all. Uh, if you don't do your homework right, you'll get murdered, yeah. We really needed the money, but we decided to not ever do that again. Words cannot express the amount of stress we went through. Uh, too many sleepless nights. Obviously, we never called the cops, but they began taking much more notice of us after that. we are all under surveillance. Now I assume that every one of my phone calls is being monitored. Hi. Hi. I'm Kate. I'm, are you here because the gun was... Yes. Please, come with me. I assume that our emails are being read and that we're even being followed. That's myself. And then if you want an alternate, it's the same first six digits and the end is 6003. And that's our office main number here if you wanted to cook the or something. Of course, they never find anything incriminating, but every time they do come, I have to wonder if this will be the time that it all comes crashing down. Marijuana, cannabis, pot. It causes high paranoia. 
Uh, you think people are chasing you? You think people are watching you? Uh, that's one of the effects of the drugs. Why in the world would anyone want to live under suspicion that the cops are watching you in the trees? I don't take any pills. I believe in holistic medicine. I work with the plant, and my daytime job is a sacred calling to healing. But the only doctors that would refer cannabis patients in this county because it was so conservative were dying patients, seizure patients, bedridden patients. They had to be like on the edge before a doctor would recommend cannabis. Not only did we end up delivering cannabis to sick people, but their medi -Cal wouldn't pay for it. And once you have a dying person on your radar, you don't make them suffer. So we were delivering cannabis for free. And then if we didn't hear from them, we would wonder, did they die? We'd call them, no, but I don't have any money. Well, that's ridiculous. We're sending somebody over right now with cannabis. Those were the years that turned me into a sister. Those years turned me into a nun. But we're in the habit? That started a few years earlier. After we all got robbed in the financial crisis, along came the Occupy movement, standing up and saying we will not accept the status quo. When the Occupy movement broke out, I was like, oh, I found my family. There's other Americans that are pissed off. I thought that was the coolest thing. We decided, we decided that we would continue the blockade. I turned to my children and said, we need to join the Occupy movement. And all the kids said, we'll go to Occupy with you Saturday if you go as a nun. So it sort of started on a dare. People who say marching doesn't do any good, they need to really read their history. Susan B. Anthony, the women's right, the black rights, Rosa Parks, nothing ever happened until people got angry and got out and started fighting back. And that's what I see what's happening. We're defending ourselves. So I went around for a while as Sister Occupy, and because I had been so deeply betrayed by the man of 17 years, and my family, the betrayal was so huge that it essentially gave me the courage to do something I really wanted to do, which was do something completely radical and nuts, like form a real sisterhood. That sort of made me go, you know what? You think I'm so bad because I'm in the weed business that I deserve homelessness? You know what? I'm done with you people. I need to build my own family. People would obviously ask me, are you a Catholic nun? No, I'm not a Catholic nun. Well, what kind of nun are you? I am a self-declared, self-empowered, anarchist activist nun. Well, that's so cool. Can I join you? No, you don't get it. I'm not trying to recruit. This is just my statement. But they would say, here's my number. I would join you. So that was pretty much the response I got everywhere I went. Before long, I was surrounded by these incredible like-minded women who believe in rebelling against the system and who believe in the healing powers of the cannabis plant. I feel like we've all been brought here for a purpose, for a cause. Most people, I think, at least in my circle, knew that there was some kind of medicine to the plant. It wasn't just like, let's smoke this plant and get high, you know? I think most people that were coming through that have a hard life, one thing I appreciate about Sister Kate is she wants to help those people. She wants to find their gift and help them. Your family heals you. 
and the cohesiveness of the family and the choice of having your family empowers you. We just want to spread our joy and what we found with everybody else, you know? Like, sorry, I'm like... Cannabis plant has done so much for me. I became a nun about six months ago. She's a great role model. And I like how spiritual she is, and I, I like what she has going here. <laughs> so, <laughs> I like her mission. Growing up, I, I, I actually developed an eating disorder, which led me to my use of cannabis. So if I don't smoke cannabis, I cannot eat. I think it's when I found out a bunch of bad things were happening in my family that I wasn't told. So. I feel like I was kind of taught to have this disorder because we've all been just thrown around by our families. So the cannabis plant has all brought us together. All of the sisters are going to Mendocino to see the region grow operation. And we are serious women on a serious mission. My goal is that we actually spread like the Catholic nuns spread across the planet, but we have the weed nuns spreading across the planet. Wednesday night coffee bandage, Miss Lori to deal with the haters, Freya and Cassidy to deal with the product and the baskets and the sales. Weed is like honey, local is best. You should have locally grown weed by the hands of local women. From the people for, that hate us, we want them to come out and talk about plant-based medicine, plant-based diet, Mother Earth. This is what we are about. This is our religion. Our healing powers are our weapon. There's a global cannabis awareness march, but I would really love it if you guys would figure out what protest you want to go to that day, and then maybe Jamie, you go with them. I remember when she called me and said, okay, I know what I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it Sisters of the Valley. And she, she was so excited because she had went down to City Hall or wherever you go to actually, you know, make it official. I think it'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say yeah. it's, going wrong. it's like a second yeah. chance. You, you've got a second chance at life. This is exciting. Most people are smoking because they want to get high. They're not smoking marijuana because they're sick. We have statistics that tell us 2%, only 2% of individuals that have the medical marijuana card really need them. If you continue going down this road of destruction, it will cost you your very soul. What we do is grow cannabis that contains high levels of CBD and very low levels of THC. So ladies, you wanna take these? I'm gonna cut them. After three to six months, we harvest the crops. This one is going to give THC, but we won't be able to cut it down. Dry them out for a couple of weeks. We bless the sacred kitchen space. Bless these hands that touch the oil. Bless these hands for they must toil. Heat up the coconut oil. Add the CBD cannabis. Cook it for three to four hours. Filter it. Essential oils, then bottle it, label it, and when we get the orders online, we send it out in the post. The cops don't seem to have an issue with cannabis that's only CBD. This makes a very healing tea. This tastes. The problem is no one would be able to tell the difference between a CBD plant and a THC plant. This, for example, is 5% THC and 11% CBD. So we can't sell this because it's too high, but we smoke it, we like it. The question I pose to you is, is that she's trying to sell a product as medicine 
What pharmaceutical background, what medical background does she have that can actually say that this heals anything? I don't believe for a minute that it heals anything. They're drug dealers and they're trying to say that it's medicine. You know they're lying. If this is really that magical stuff, I haven't seen any evidence in our pharmaceuticals in this country. Why aren't they harvesting this? If it's really there, why aren't they doing it? They want to get high. That's why they use any drug. They want to get high. There's multiple medical studies about the efficacy of cannabidiol. No one really knows the full extent of what it does because it acts on so many things. It's it's maddening and 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 it's kind of the reason why people don't understand why does this one thing work for all of these diseases? They got to be faking it. But the truth is there's almost no disease that you can name that isn't uh, helped by cannabis. I've had Bell's palsy. Your face gets droopy. You, you lose sensation of your eye. You lose sensation of your face. I did the CBD oil and the CBD salve. In two weeks, I was almost back to normal. For me, it's it's a lifesaver. Most of the cancer patients I see smoking marijuana, they end up dying eventually. We are technically illegal here because to run a business on your property, you have to have a conditional use permit from the county. We have never been issued a conditional use permit by the county. I was determined to not let THC cannabis laws stop me from distributing non-THC products. And what do you want to do? Let's just say you get some local corporations, dispensaries go up, uh, everything start rolling. What's your goal with this? Where do you want to take it? To me, we'll have made it if we could create like 10,000 or 20,000 good jobs here in the Central Valley. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? We, we, we could use those big time. Do you know, we're, we're the most depressed uh, community in the state. I think the Central Valley should be the leading CBD exporter in the world. So there's probably no limit to how Sisters of the Valley could have a serious, serious industry here in the Central Valley. We have applied for a conditional use permit from the county. If Merced County could, they would outlaw all cannabis, all cannabis grow operations, all cannabis deliveries, because the old guard is still making all the rules. Like most of America, the state of California is very religious. There are over 50 churches in Merced County alone. And, and it's so funny here that everybody grows because the girl behind the desk, I'm getting an extra room, and then she says, do you mind if I ask what kind of nuns you are? So I tell her, and then she goes, oh my God, would you bless my pot of crop? Ah, yeah. <laughs> this is the receptionist behind the desk. The public have gotten angry at us when they thought we were Catholic nuns. I kind of don't get why anybody would be offended. We're more Native American and Beguin. We follow our Beguin mothers, and they're more uh, earth lovers and plant lovers. Not that we don't believe in a creator God, but we don't follow necessarily the Christian principles. We're just, we're about How can you not God. call yourself nuns? We don't. We call ourselves sisters. We nuns was a hand that was given to us. We're sisters. Love love. We have, in our beliefs, we put, like, uh, our number one belief is organizing our lives by the moon cycles and the quarters of the year. Our number two belief is in being compassionate with other people on the planet. So are you right. trying to say that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't exist? Oh, no, I'm just saying that that's not our... Because I am a pastor. Okay, but that's not our debate, so we totally respect your beliefs. We would never... But how can you call yourself sisters? Because of the definition of a sister of a nun is they live together, they work together, they pray together, and they take vows. We you, live together, we work together, we pray together, and we take vows. That is not our discussion. We are not the having the discussion. We will not have the discussion about Jesus Christ. But, I mean... It, We're not it, practicing. We're not walking the walk of Jesus. So yeah, we it, don't want to have that debate. Our debate is all... That's your debate. That's your domain. 
We're very humble farm women who make medicine and get it to the people. Nice to meet you, Pastor. It is important to have a spiritual element. People's souls need it. Even though I was raised Catholic, I didn't really care what happened at church on Sunday. That was the least of it. I've been practicing my own spiritual practices since I was like seven years old. Our order follows the Begins, who were the first organized nurses in the castles of Europe in the Middle Ages. Interestingly enough, there is a strong connection between the beliefs of the Beguines and those of the Native Americans of this land. We need structure, tradition, and we need service in our life. We overdid individual freedom. We have to step back to a balance on obligation to the tribe. Uh, for Sister Kate, I thank you for all that you do. The Native Americans have been working with the cannabis plant for centuries. David the Elder comes to our ceremonies. We have a special connection between the sisters and the natives. We share each other's talks, we share each other's words. There is no differences. We're all the same. We're all one people. They're medicine people, and I come to visit the medicine people. When I got an Awish, and I can't go to my medicine people, then I'll go to the conventional place called a hospital. But this is my new hospital. So, so this is a form of, of my drugstore. Merced County is really poor, which is why having a legit cannabis business here is necessary and good because of the jobs we create. But there's also a lot of crime here. And of course, there's a lot of addicts here using heroin and meth and God knows what else. I suppose it's not surprising that it was only a matter of time before these problems reached our own family's doorstep. After my mom finally got settled and we finally didn't really have to worry, that's when my guard came down and that's when I broke down and um, started looking for an escape and eventually turned to drugs. Let me see it again. Ooh. I was messing around with this white powder. It was some white crystally stuff. Okay, here, mom is gonna do some. I put them here, and now I dry them off. It didn't matter at the time. It was something that made me feel okay, good. Now you got to dry them off with your towel and then throw them on the pan. Okay. And my mom did find out that it was crystal meth. She freaked. Alex looked like a 14-year-old. He went from going being a big buff workout guy to being a scrawny little meth-addicted nutbag. Alex, what you doing? She asked me if I wanted to go off to rehab, and at first, it freaked me out um, because I knew, at the time, it felt like I knew I would never be happy again. You've been a yes. good boy, Alex. Yes. When? When were you good? I say all the time, Dad. A recovery clinic cost about $15,000 for 30 days. Hadn't talked to his father in years. His father had health insurance and I did not. Show mom. <gasps> What'd you get? Show mom, hold it up so she can see it. And I remember I had to sit on the phone with his father every night. We'd been in battle all these decades, but I got him to agree to pay for Alex's recovery. So like any good addict would do, I went and bought a big 
bag of dope the night before I had to go to rehab. Yeah. What you got? And attempted to overdose. Very nice. Thank you. And that night, my heart was starting to shut down and beat slower and slower. And I was starting to fall asleep on a very high concentration of meth. Which, that's, you're just dying. I could feel it happening, so I had to force myself to stay up throughout the whole night, and the only way I could do that was staying posted up against the wall. Or else, because if I was sitting right here, I would literally nod off. Oh, are you getting sleepy? And it was, it was scary. Hey, give me my darn bottle, I just want it. Go to bed. Eventually ended up in rehab and a halfway home. Six days after I came back from rehab, I did relapse. I had a kid who was just in horrible shape. Frank, she said all of the programs with recovering meth addicts fail. She said, you know, you're an experimental kind of woman. Experiment. You're locked in jail, what'd you do? And that's when she decided to just take my cell phone, take the keys to the van, take everything, and put me on house arrest for an extended period of time. And the only thing I get is uh, food, gym, and weed. Unlimited weed. What happened? For six months, uh, she did that until she was confident enough that I could go other places. When people hear a drug addict, they think junkie, user, somebody who just doesn't want to be clean, but they don't understand that a lot of us really, really want and need, just need help. You love your kid? Give your kid a safe environment and let him come out of his depression on his own. Upwards of twenty or $30,000 for a month in rehab. But I think it's worth it because I'm now clean and not spending that 30000 on dope. We're trying to walk a more compassionate, enlightened line. I think we're seeing really good results with Alex's recovery. My mom definitely saved my life. She was really the only one there for me and willing to help me out. I am so grateful that I got to take the compassionate route. Just days after recreational marijuana sales began in California, the Attorney General's decision could dampen the spark that ignited the pot industry's massive growth. Today, Jeff Sessions rescinded an Obama administration policy which largely shielded legalized marijuana from federal intervention, allowing prosecutors to enforce federal law that prohibits pot sales. I have empowered our prosecutors to charge and pursue the most serious offense, as I believe the law requires. These are drug dealers, and you drug dealers are going to prison. I think it's pretty clear right now that our federal government is a joke. It matters to the point that we care, because we don't want them busting in and taking away anything, so we care in that we have to respect it. If the federal government decided to shut us down, if they decided they were gonna shut down all hemp growers, then yes, that would be catastrophic. It could be the end of the Sisters of the Valley. According to the federal government, heroin and methamphetamine have certain you know, medical applications. So it, marijuana is perceived, at least by the government, to be more harmful. But the number of people who died from marijuana overdose this year and it's zero, and it always has been zero. You're saying that heroin and methamphetamine is okay and marijuana isn't, well, what is that based on? A real analytical assessment of the harm? Because it can't be. I think, ironically, we will do a better job of policing marijuana in this state once it's legal than the failed effort over decades to address it uh, through the criminal courts. So can sheriff's department search warrant? So many people think that they've got the answer. Well, if we just legalize it and, and uh, plain and simple, we won't have the problems. 
Yes, you will. We're going to have these problems. And it's just because of the nature of the beast, because it's so lucrative, because the amount of money invested in growing this stuff is really not that much. And when you can go from seedling to cultivation in 90 days, that's a lot of product. I'm kind of worried about all of us here. This is the season where people start creeping up on the property. So right now we're pretty exposed. At the end of the day, you can either get robbed by thieves or you're gonna get messed with by the police. If they would have come for you and they find out what your permit says, you're in trouble. I'm scared of the sheriff. I'm scared of the police. If they come and they take your shit. Your year's lost. Your whole year that you did. All that you worked on, gone. Looks like nobody's here. Probably they're in the middle of uh, maybe a switch out or somebody coming to check on it. Maybe they check on it uh, every other day, every couple days. And that's the uh, finished product. Pretty good quality, you know? You can see the uh, THC on there in the crystal form, the kind of purple uh, look that they like to it. This house could probably turn out about one and a half million a year, illegally, with uh, two stage grows every 60 days. Do you think that that could ever happen to Sister Kate? Does well, she get yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it could happen to her. I, mean, I, I don't, I don't know why. What, what would make Sister Kate exempt from it? It'll be an interesting case if they do uh, a raid her. Maybe that's what it'll take to bring this whole thing in the light and start the, start, the, uh, start the action on what it's going to take to legislate the difference and make the distinction in the law. Sheriff Warnke, he keeps saying that we're bringing in high THC into the county and we're lying about it. Okay. So I just wanted to show you what we go through. Underneath here are test results from SC Labs. Oh. If somebody was getting high off of our products, we would have been shut down at the federal mm -hmm. level a long mm -hmm. time ago. Right. And so these are what somebody needs to know exists. Okay. I'm gonna make copies of these, sure. old copies. And not, this, these I'm gonna, uh, sure. I'm gonna show these to Vern, uh, the work here, our sheriff. Uh, Thank uh, you, I knew somebody would speak reason he's, here. Uh, he's one of the skeptics that you're gonna have to deal with. I was determined to get the most amount of CBD to the most amount of people. So we sort of hired Will and his company to go in and deal with them to get our permit. Sometimes you have to fight fire with fire. In this case, we hired lobbyists because we don't want to lose their business. We have too much to lose now. We've been dealing with the local officials, meeting with them on her behalf. We'd like to have them accept a pilot program that would only be for non-psychoactive CBD cultivation. We've learned how to crossbreed marijuana plants to produce either high THC plants or high CBD with very little THC, uh, stuff that wouldn't really get anyone high. Uh, it is non-psychoactive medicine for people who have debilitating diseases. So that's what we're doing. We're talking to the five supervisors trying to change the law. Hiring suits to deal with the suits, that's a little unorthodox, but that's what we did. It's now time for a public opportunity to speak. Testimony is limited to three minutes per person. As you know, I appeared a few weeks ago to represent the Sisters of the Valley who produce non-psychoactive products for marijuana. And we think a pilot program would be a wonderful chance for your staff to supervise a community development agreement that would grant a conditional use. We're an open book. Please regulate us. Please tax us. And uh, I thank you for your time. Next. You're going to talk, and Freya's going to talk. I, I had an old native, listen, I had an old Native American man tell me about four years ago when I started this, you've already realized your power with words, but you have not yet realized your power of silence. So I am planning to go there and be silent. And you're going to be my one gun, you're going to be my legal, logical gun, and Freya's going to be my heart, compassionate, medicine gun, and I'm just going to sit there and try not to say 
anything for two hours, which, Please do by that. the way, is not <laughs> easy for me. The retail business would probably be valued at around $5 million right now. So there's $5 million to lose. And that's where we are right now. We have something to lose, so we care about the rules. I don't believe that she'll be issued a permit because that would open up a door for other producers to import marijuana to the community. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't believe that she will be issued a permit. If we got denied, that would be really bad for us. We'd have to, sh we'd have to quit. It is a mess. It is a total mess. We're going to try to fight under state law to get her the permit that she's due. I think if we can get her that permit, her future's bright. they've all come around to the idea that we're in the hemp business, right? And they've all come around to the idea that we should be made legal here. But it was really good that I did very little talking. I mean, I did talk. I told you I was going to talk. <laughs> Hold on to your habits, girls, when I'd see Jamie hitting the gas. She's bought her home and raised her kids here. She wants to stay here and give jobs to a struggling community, the second poorest county in the state. You know, the future of cannabis for our state is, is pretty bright, I think. If we want to have a meaningful impact on distribution, we have to get our products into all the stores and all the pharmacies around the planet. There's interest in Sisters of the Valley globally. Number of people that want to talk to us just never seem to stop. I am freaking out right now. I've been looking forward to this for so long. They call themselves Sisters of the Valley. Sisters of the Valley. Cultivo de la Marihuana. They are in the business of helping people in pain. Our sisterhood requires us to take the time to teach the world about CBD and cannabis. Bring outside money and outside jobs from the rest of the world to the poor people of the Central Valley. Had I not been completely broken down, ass against the wall, not a cent, old life completely stripped of me, and I may not have had the courage. When people have everything taken away, you should be scared, because they will do some radical shit. It's an ancient tradition that if you have a change in your life that's dramatic, you take a new name. Many of the sisters like the idea that they choose that new name for this new life. Christine is the woman that the family shit on. Kate, don't shit on Kate. Hey. 